This video is brought to you by Bizwire TV, where your news is made. So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Sock Exchange. And uh, first of all, I should point out that today is the 30th anniversary of Big Bang. Uh, and Big Bang was a very significant event in the history of the London Stock Exchange and the London stock markets. And the deregulation that occurred at that time that enabled banks to buy stockbroking businesses that removed fixed commissions led very clearly to the dramatic success of London as a financial centre in the subsequent 30 years. Uh, there are also those that argue that Big Bang uh, inadvertently led to the financial crisis uh, of 2008 because by enabling high street banks to buy investment banks and to create investment banks, of course it brought that risk taking and that leverage into the high street banks and changed the culture of those high street banks which then led to the disastrous uh, financial uh, results that some of those banks uh, produced uh, around that time. Anyway, however, uh, to celebrate I'm wearing my blue button from that time because I was a, a young stockbroker in those days uh, and spent some time on the floor of the stock exchange in the old open outcry uh, environment that there was then before it moved to a technology platform in offices uh, and I used to wander around the stock exchange floor uh, asking prices of uh, market makers as we call them now in those days they were known as stock jobbers uh, and uh, the blue button actually meant that, uh, that I really was a lackey I was basically a gopher so I couldn't actually trade I could only ask a price anyway all of that is now done online so life has changed and move on Laurie Milbank and Co which got subsumed into Chase Manhattan Securities, uh, which was part of Chase Manhattan, the New York uh, commercial bank. And it won't surprise you to know that about, I guess, probably 10 years after Big Bang, uh, it pretty much had closed it down and realised that it wasn't a business that Chase Manhattan should be in. Anyway, moving on to Brexit. Uh, Brexit, arguably a, a significant event uh, as Big Bang 30 years ago. Ah, oh, I found the point that the changer and I'm now going the wrong way so here we go so my agenda today is really just to give you a bit of an update on Brexit a bit of a primer as to where we are to refresh your minds maybe to clarify a little a few things and to give some sort of reflections on how it's affecting the world of investor relations uh, how you might communicate the impact of Brexit uh, to investors and to the markets um, it, 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 actually, the last year, you really couldn't kind of make up what's happened over the sort of last year or so in terms of politics. Uh, it really has been an extraordinary period of time. And I often think that if I'd been a sort of an author or a playwright or something like that, and I'd written a play based on the events of the last year and taken it to a publisher, the publisher probably would have thought I was completely mad uh, and told me to go back and rewrite the whole thing because uh, really one couldn't make it up as, as to what's been happening. So uh, I've entitled this first slide the, f the five stages of remoning uh, because I suspect that most of us in this room, uh, if we had a vote, probably voted to remain. Certainly my experience of, uh, shall we say, the city uh, colleagues is that probably it's been 90% remain uh, and only about 10% Brexit. It was really outside London and the rest of the country that there was such a strong feeling uh, that we should get out. Uh, and so for those of us that uh, were remain voters, uh, the initial shock, uh, uh, you know, has taken a while, should we say, to, to come to terms with. Uh, and I've borrowed the, the Kubler-Ross model, uh, which uh, is a psychologist model, which talks about anger, you know, then you go through that stage of denial, then into the bargaining phase, depression, and as Private Eye kindly uh, pointed out to me in one of their cartoons, uh, we now have Mrs May. Uh, hopefully to rescue us all. Anyway, what do we know about remoning? What we know is there won't be a second referendum. Even on my Twitter timeline this week, I saw a friend tweeting to sign up for a petition for a second referendum. I really don't think that's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be no snap election. In fact, I suspect we won't have an election until the next one is due in five years' time. Uh, the UK as a whole is out. Uh, that much is clear. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon will no doubt do her best to somehow change that, but it looks like that is going to be the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, what is interesting about the by-election uh, this uh, coming autumn in Richmond that uh, Zach Goldsmith has uh, initiated uh, is that I think the Ramonas will try and turn that into a Brexit 
mini-referendum. Uh, and there will be other issues and other events, no doubt, where they will try to do the same thing. They may or may not fail in that respect. Similarly, there is no doubt that the media and the metropolitan elite, what people call the Westminster bubble, continues to snipe away. And again, my Twitter timeline is full of that. And it's it, the cheerleaders seem to be a sort of combination of the Financial Times, Newsnight, the Today programme, etc., uh, etc., et who take every opportunity to have a go at Brexit and to whinge if they see something which is a sign of weakness. But actually, the reality is that there's been a lack of bad Brexit news. In fact, the majority of news to date has exceeded expectations in terms of you know, the economic uh, situation. We've got some GDP figures out in about 20 minutes' time, which people suspect are going to be slightly better uh, than uh, was originally uh, told to us by Project Fear. And as yet, we haven't had any disastrous investment decisions whereby international companies are pulling out of the UK. Uh, if anything, there's been signs that actually uh, there will be continue to be investment by foreign investors in the UK. Um, so what are the known knowns uh, in terms of what's actually happening? Uh, this is your primer. Uh, first of all, the PM has said she will trigger Article 50 uh, by the end of March. There is then this strict two-year deadline to conclude negotiations. So in theory, we'll be done and dusted by March 2019. I think probably a betting man would suspect that they'll have to make an agreement to extend that a little bit, but let's hope not. Uh, essentially, it's about divorce terms. Uh, so things like borders, EU institutions, payments, residency, employment, passporting, etc., etc. Uh, only once those negotiations have concluded can trade negotiations begin, which I think is a very important point, which probably many of us haven't been sort of totally au fait with. So those trade deal negotiations won't start for another couple of years. Uh, obviously, in the meantime, the UK will be free to go and make other trade negotiations elsewhere. It requires this comprehensive review of the UK legal system and it looks like ultimately it will be triggered through Parliament by a Great Repeal Act which will effectively adopt all historic EU le legislation, keep that on the statute book, uh, and then we'll move on from that point. Um, and lastly but not leastly, it seems that Parliament in effect is delegating powers to government to take decisions albeit Parliament will ultimately have a vote or some votes on the matter. So I was rather amused by this uh, front page cover of yesterday's City AM, uh, which has generally actually veered towards the sort of Brexiting side of things, uh, historically, and uh, refer to the Walloony tunes, the fact that you really you couldn't have made up the fact that the small province of Wallonia uh, had basically kiboshed uh, the EU's deal uh, with Canada after many, many years. And the Canadian Trade Minister, I think, described the EU as being impossible. Uh, now, uh, that perhaps reflects uh, the view that um, uh, many Brexiteers have had over the years that really the EU is impossible and that we're very much better out when perhaps we can make our own deals without having to worry about what, Lo what Wallonia thinks. So I think that's quite an interesting... Um, should we say, development uh, in the way that things are, uh, are currently going on. So what are the known unknowns? And I think probably the biggest one is whether we have a hard or a soft Brexit. Uh, and no doubt you will have read those phrases uh, a lot in the newspaper being sort of banded out. Uh, hard Brexit, basically leaving the single market, control of our own borders, principally championed by uh, those three leading Brexiteers, uh, Fox, Johnson and Davis. A soft Brexit access to the single market, an immigration deal broadly supported by the Chancellor uh, and most Conservative MPs, according to my colleagues in our political team. Uh, Mrs May recently set out some red lines, uh, taking back control of UK borders, uh, no jurisdiction uh, for the European Court of Justice. Um, but I think she's trying very hard uh, and very noticeably not to say whether she prefers a hard or a soft exit. At this stage, her kind of bargaining plan, shall we say, has not been to, has been not to show her cards uh, to Europe too much. Uh, and there's been a bit of frustration in the Westminster bubble about that, but I suspect that she's right uh, not to put her kind of chips on the table too early. 
Um, what we don't know, of course, uh, is the EU's negotiating position. Will it take a hard or a soft stance? I think the expectation is that they won't want to encourage other countries to have referendums and to come out. So they're probably going to be quite tough, uh, uh, or as tough as they can be. On the other hand, uh, if it's correct that we're sending 350 million quid a week or whatever it was, uh, then they need our money. So uh, they can't afford to kind of piss us off too much for the time being. Excuse my French. Um, and, and a new concept to me, which I learnt this week from my colleagues in, in, the, in our political team, the open versus closed Brexit. Uh, and that's really whether we have a world view, an open view of what we want to be as a nation going forward. And I think that's very much where the Brexiteers kind of pin their flag, that we would look openly to the rest of the world uh, rather than being inward looking. And the closed Brexit option, therefore, is the protectionist option, where we sort of essentially close down and become this little island. Uh, and I, I very much hope that it will be an open Brexit, uh, and I'm sure that most people in the room would agree with me on that. And I've mentioned the investment decisions uh, that foreign investors uh, in the UK will take uh, a significant and important uh, future unknown. Um, and then, of course, we move on to the unknown unknowns. And of course, because they're unknown unknowns, I can't speculate as to what they might be. But I thought you'd enjoy this cartoon uh, that was in the Times uh, a, a week or two ago. Um, the killer clowns terrorising Britain uh, with their hard Brexit. Uh, David Davis, Boris Johnson and Liam Fox. Um, but if one was to speculate as to what the unknown unknowns are, I guess it's, you know, what, what will be the result of the various elections in Europe this year, uh, in 2017, in Germany, in France, and so on? Um, you know, will there be further referendum in other countries, uh, and so on and so forth? Um, will we have an economic, uh, you know, recession perhaps next year or the year after? So um, perhaps those are the unknown unknowns that uh, we can worry about. Um, so, uh, as far as how the stock market is viewing things, viewing life, how investors are viewing things, what are the, the themes that, that we as advisors and we as companies who uh, 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 and investor relations people uh, advising our chief executives and talking to investors, what are the things we need to bear in mind within all, within, within all of this? Uh, clearly, the currency fall has been very significant. That's why the stock market is riding relatively high. Um, Confidence, I think, has been restored, firstly, by the swift actions of the Bank of England. Uh, whether they were right or wrong at the time to cut rates, nonetheless, I think it did the trick uh, in terms of confidence. Uh, the rapid change of PM and of Chancellor, all of those actions, you know, they happened so quickly. I think that really did save the day at the time. And if we'd had an extended sort of Tory party leadership election or whatever, uh, then I think we, re we really would have been in trouble. Um, so uh, that has been good. Um, uncertainty clearly is going to persist merely because of the length of the process. Uh, and there is no doubt that there is going to be, you know, tremendous speculation. Uh, the Westminster bubble will be tweeting itself uh, into, into a sort of, you know, spin fest. Uh, over the next couple of years as to what the outcome is going to be um, and trying to scare the pants all, uh, off all of us. Um, the market, the stock market, has arguably climbed the wall of worry, which is one of my favourite stock market phrases, but essentially the fact that it is at the levels it is broadly suggests that it, it has discounted a lot of the short-term risks around Brexit uh, and it is prepared to sort of get on with life. Uh, and there's perhaps a bit more focus on an acceptance of Brexit benefits and discounting of the negatives. Um, having said that, definitely a risk-off approach from investors. Uh, it's a buyer's market, without doubt, having talked to a few of my stockbroking mates uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, and having completed two IPOs uh, in the NHP stable uh, in the last couple of weeks, successful IPOs. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there was pressure on pricing. There will continue to be and it's worth noting this morning that Mysis's IPO has been pulled, uh, and I suspect that was around pricing and, and the institutions just basically saying, you know, we're not going to pay that price for that type of company at this point, given the risk situation. Uh, and just to sort of throw a few things and keep the pot boiling, 
uh, to keep that wall of worry uh, sort of, you know, filled up. Uh, we've got the US election. Uh, we've got concerns about global economic growth. We've got QE addiction withdrawal symptom worries. Uh, so there's lots of stuff for the market to worry about, for investors to worry about. So as always, it's important for companies to be very clear in their messaging and very clear about what the impact of all these things is on their businesses. Uh, and what are the things that the analysts are looking at and the things that, uh, that companies are talking about in relation to Brexit? Well, certainly our clients um, have talked about very short-lived pre- and post-referendum slowdowns, fortunately only a few weeks either side, depending on the nature of their businesses. There have been some nasty Q3 profits warnings, but actually those have been largely unrelated to Brexit. I think they've been company or market specific. Clearly, we've got the currency translation issue. Is it a tailwind? Is it a headwind? Uh, the margin squeeze issue, I think, is the one that's really potentially got the sort of, you know, the bite in it for market expectations, for forecasts. Uh, we've seen that already with the Tesco Unilever spat. Uh, and I, can, I think we're going to see that um, come through in certain sectors, particularly like retailers. Uh, what it suggests is, actually, in my view, is that rather than putting prices up, companies won't have that pricing power, consumers won't pay the prices, and so they will have to cut prices or keep prices down uh, rather than increasing them, and that will put a squeeze on margins. Cost down actions, i.e. where companies go to their suppliers and ask for a price cut in order not to have to put prices up to the consumer, I think we're going to see lots of that. Uh, import substitution, export opportunity, clearly companies should be taking advantage of that where they can. Uh, and we'll no doubt be talking about that where they have successes. Uh, consumer confidence, business confidence, again, one of those sort of known unknowns as to which way that's going to go. It's probably on a slightly stable trend at the moment. And we've talked about the elections. So conclusion, um, Brexit means Brexit, as Mrs May said uh, very clearly. Uh, and I think most people have, most Ramonas amongst us have, have kind of uh, got used to that view. Uh, and perhaps uh, are embracing it more positively and learning to live with it. And certainly that's been our attitude uh, at, uh, back at MHP Towers. Uh, is it you, not me, that's the problem? I think actually that's a, a really, you know, a, a question that we should all ask ourselves, and I think that will become clearer over the next year or two, actually, as to whether the EU model can survive. Uh, certainly there have been some very interesting pontifications on that factor as to whether the euro will survive, uh, whether there will be, as I say, from these elections in Europe in the next year or two, whether there are going to be some dramatic outcomes from that. Uh, we've already seen the fact that the Spanish have not been able to ha have a government, uh, and in fact it looks like they're about to, to finally appoint one today, but they've had no government for 300 days, which is a pretty extraordinary statistic. So I think that's a little hint uh, as to uh, maybe uh, we will, after all, be quite pleased that we're out uh, and it's their problem. But I think my, re my recommendation, our recommendation, and I think most uh, companies that I advise, uh, they're seeing life as business as usual for the time being. And I think that's a good way to get on with things. Uh, in the context of quarter to quarter stock market volatility, that never goes away. Economic uncertainty is a given, that never goes away. But we've got a relatively stable UK political situation, whatever the, the uh, Westminster bubble likes to tell us. Uh, so ultimately, we should keep communicating to investors uh, and keep delivering our messages. Uh, and uh, that's really all we can do, and uh, not listen to the noise. Uh, so I leave you with another cartoon from my man in the Times uh, from July, just after Mrs May was appointed. Uh, and you may recall there was quite a lot about the cat. Uh, the Downing Street cat, uh, but actually it looks like it was a bit more than the cat, it's the lion, the Brexit lion that roared. Uh, and we've, uh, we've got to put our faith that Mrs May will uh, see us through. <laughs>